Hi, I'm Jesse. I'm the founder and editor of Apology Magazine. I'm also the designer, art director, custodian, distributor, etc. of Apology Magazine. Um, Apology is a zine of literature, interviews, art, culture, and this podcast is an extension of the magazine where I'll be doing long, loose interviews with all kinds of people. We'll focus a lot on books and reading, but anything else that comes up is fair game too. And hopefully you'll leave each episode with a couple new books that you want to check out. For my first episode, I asked my old friend Matt Sweeney to join me. Matt is a professional musician. He's mainly a guitar player, but also a bassist and a singer. He's played with Will Oldham, Cat Power, Guided by Voices, Iggy Pop, Neil Diamond, Kid Rock, Johnny Cash, LP, Run the Jewels, and Endless Boogie, many more. He's got a very wide and diverse resume as a musician. He's also super well-read, and his tastes are very wide and diverse in books and he's definitely hipped me to a few things that I probably wouldn't have found without his recommendation. So let's get into it. Matt Sweeney, Apology Podcast, Episode 1. So what are you reading right now? I am reading a book uh, that my friend D.V. Vincentis gave me by a guy called, uh, I think it's Wurlitzer? Rudy Wurlitzer, I think is Rudy his name. Rudy Wurlitzer. And uh, yeah, Rudy Wurlitzer, and the book is called The Drop Edge of Yonder. Contemporary? It's contemporary, but uh, it turns out like DV and Will Oldham were, did a did a book on tape of R- Rudy Wurlitzer, and that I guess DV and Will have been telling me about this guy for, for years, and I just somehow was ignorant to it. And so then, the, what are the basics on him? Where's where's he from? What's his style? What's he like? DV told me his background. I think he may have written Tulane fucking blacktop. May have written. I Tulane think. Blacktop. I think he wrote Two Lane Blacktop. The, the screenplay. The screenplay. Or maybe the money the book, or maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. It's stuff like that, like unbelievably cool shit that that he was involved in. So it's he's you know seventies guy. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think he's still alive. Uh, I think that he's always sort of been on the on the edges of things. Um, and this book is this book's super fun. It's a western. Um, hyper violent, picaresque, following this, uh, following a, a horse thief. It's, it, there, there's no, it's not trying to be realistic in any way. Uh, lots of visionary stuff. Mm. Uh, it's the, the first thing that happens is he's, he, he is freezing to death. He, he, uh, the, the, the main character's freezing to death. He finds a little cabin in the woods. There's two people in the cabin. Uh, he ends up having sex with one of them, a, a, a woman, and in the middle of having sex with her, the other guy, the the other person comes in because I guess the person was out hunting or something like that, yeah. and a huge fight breaks out. He kills the, the he kills the uh, the other guy, and then the woman ends up drowning in a river, okay. and she puts a curse on him. And this is all like in the first three pages. Is, just, is, is it, this played for for laughs? It's played for fun. Yeah, it's not. It's not really played for laughs, and it's not played for like woo woo either. It's like, it's it it's got an it's the book's just got a great forward momentum. And I, you know what? I swear to God, it is very hard to describe what the tone of this book is because uh, both DV, who's a writer, and, and my friend Dave Hollander, who's a writer and also just. A, is into great stuff. Uh, they were the, both of them kind of tag team. They were like, we just read this book and it was there. And yeah. like, they, there was a copy of it there. They're like, take this book and read it. Yeah. And neither one of them could accurately describe what the book was other than it's a blast to read. Wow. I feel like Western is this one genre that is endless. There's always more to discover. Yeah. You know, it, it just keeps going deeper and deeper. I remember really later than I should have learning about a writer like Oakley Hall, for example. Yeah, who I haven't read, but I know. Warlock that- is the one to start with. The novel of his, Warlock, yeah. But yeah. You, you know about him. Yeah, I mean, I know about him because I know that, that he's a writer that, that must be read, and my friend had a band called Ugly Hall. Right. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, for sure, Westerns are... It, it's it's funny how the... I mean, it's... Uh, the... Like, I like that. I like that stuff. Uh, the, and, and it's surprising because I'm from New Jersey, and I don't have a hard-on for mm. Western stuff, you know? Or what, I mean, I like cowboy movies or whatever, but it's like, you know, and I don't know if it's, you know, something as obvious as Cormac McCarthy that, that got, got it rolling for me probably is, you know, um, 
But there's so, there's really fun guys like uh, William Kittredge. Have you read him? Mm-hmm. That was the Sprague Hollander turned me on to him. Yeah, was our, our, really funny writing. Elmore Leonard's early books are all westerns. And is that right? They're often hilarious too. Yeah, I like that the western. You can go from everything from like really funny, almost Coen Brothersy sort of um, you know slapstick, all the way to like apocalyptic high diction Cormac McCarthy for sure. You know terror. The the uh, the book that I would recommend. Uh, if, if we're talking about westerns, that that, that was it's definitely like I think a a great one to know about uh, is called Comanches, and there's various editions of it. Sometimes it's called Comanches: The Story of a People. Sometimes I think the original title was Comanches: The Destruction of a People, mm. and the writer is named T. R. Fahrenbach, and it is one of the most fucking mind blowing books I've ever read. The the first. It's a big, thick ass book. The first third of it is prehistory, mm. setting up the story for the, the, that that we know, you know, mm-hmm. or, or setting up the, the the world that we know and mm-hmm. and, and how they came to the, Amer- the how they came to be known in the American West. Um, but the the they are it's the the harshness and just nastiness of the Comanches, the badassery, like. They, you know, like basically they were, they were wandering people. They would just basically destroy wherever they lived and leave it and leave it behind and leave all the old people and all the trash behind. Wow. They were like just so savage and wow. so like the, the whole myth of the, or, or, or no, it's not a myth, but the, the, every American Indian myth is completely turned on its head when, when, when you start reading right. about these guys. Well, it shows you how the, the, the. The quote unquote noble savage myth of American Indians is just as false as the yeah. savage savage myth. Correct. Did the Comanches have like a culture, an art, or literary, or sort of nope. visual culture? No. Nope. No time for that. Just <laughs> burn it no, all. No, no. Yeah, yeah, really nothing. <laughs> um, like so hard. And this, and it's these people who stopped Western civilization for like 20 years, like stopped the expansion. They were the wall. They were the wall. It was like, you know, a couple hundred guys. Interesting. They were that fucking badass. Um, but the the book is also like this incredible history of America. It's like you get a way deeper understanding of what of how the Spanish influences, how the French influence influences, and it all mm-hmm. is told through the lens of the Comanches, and also the way that American Indian tribes hated each other, and the whole idea of like yeah. of of a despised people. Yeah. But it's a book. It is just like it is the tri- and it's written. It's one of these books. Like a, my friend Dan Margulies, who's a history professor, a professor who's um. He's, you know, only reads academic books and stuff. And when I brought up that book, he goes, he goes, that book is an anomaly. He goes, that book actually has no, I don't know where to file that book because it is an academic book, but it's so well written that it qualifies as literature. It's written and with some personality. Huge amounts of personality. Yeah. When is it from? Do you know? It's like seventies. Okay, sold on that. that oh man, great. dude, and it's impossible that Cormac McCarthy did not read this yeah. book. It's impossible. I'm it, sure. It, there's a there's a it's, I suspect he's a big researcher on everything. I, I think, think so, he reads yeah. really deeply. I mean, and this one, this one is the one. If if you like that grimy, scary, terrifying American Indian stuff, this is dude, so <laughs> good. And 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 I have to give credit to uh, my friend Matthew Johnson, who the is, fat possum, the guy. fat possum dude the is fat like is a, is, a, is, a, is a voracious reader, yeah. and I, I want you should do him. He'd be great cool. on the show. Yeah. Um, and he he's has never steered me you know like has never yeah. steered me wrong in a book and but Comanches was a book that he'd been telling me about for 10 years and was, for some reason I never got my my hands on it yeah. um but that one is that's a, that's a smash if, if if we're talking about westerns and yeah i mean from from Comanches to this to this drop edge of yonder such a wide gamut. Between the <laughs> yeah, two. it's a, yeah. it's a, that's about as that's probably about as wide as I could think yeah, of, yeah, of, yeah. of where the drop of, of the honor is definitely it's a dude who's on psychedelics writing a book it seems. But well, westerns lend themselves very well to psychedelic sort of moods, the landscapes mm-hmm. and the, and and the strange lifestyles. We're gonna get off westerns soon, okay, but it just made me oh. curious. Have you watched this new Coen Brothers Netflix I did. film? I did. What do you think about it? I don't know. I um, feel like a lot of it was about it was like reacting to the sort of. You talked about being a New Jersey in New Jerseyite. Mm-hmm. What are yeah. we? Are we New Jerseyites? New Jer- uh, New- whatever. Yes, we're Jersey folk. Yes, um, we're Jerseys. We're Jerseyans. <laughs> um, there is this sort of like children's boy, like specifically for like boys, 
like storybook Western world in and like that's the fifties and sixties. That kind of was a middle America thing, right? Yeah, and right. It, it, the first couple of in chapters at least feel very like that Western mythology from that kind of perspective, right? But then it just gets more and more brutal. Oh my God, the Liam Neeson the, with the torso guy who just like oh recites like God, uh, that was so poetry. Brutal. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there, there is. I it was funny. I watched it by myself. My girlfriend was out of town, and I was a little sad about that and then i put it on because i was like she's probably not gonna want to watch this and so i'll watch it now and i think i liked it but then also there are times i was like huh why did i what was that all about yeah like like there was a bunch you know i was like and then she gets shot in the head you know uh they all have kind of pat they feel like fables almost with like sort of pat endings yeah and and, and they feel like the whole thing i mean it, it is am i wrong or is it all just nihilistic endings very nihilistic yeah and and nothing matters and well i guess tom waits kind of gets away a little clean in his chapter right anyway yeah um but but i thought it was okay you know like like i I thought it was all right it's It's, the thing about these uh, anthology sort of films is there's always one thing that's like if you watch the twilight zone movie from like 82 right that i love that one one. of them is great one of them is terrible yeah yeah exactly yeah Um, and which and i have no problem with that uh i'm glad it's there and i think it's cool that people are talking about it i remember i didn't even like Bum out too hard on the soundtrack. Um, did it was, some, who it did was, the soundtrack? Same, I think it's the same dude who always does, does their, their, their stuff. But it was like, it was okay. Oh, I just okay. remembered. I don't want to go too deep on this, but we're talking about Westerns. And you but, did soundtrack work for Red Dead Redemption 2, didn't that's you? That's correct. This, yeah. this is a fact about you. That is a fact about me. And in fact, speaking of, yeah, so we're always keeping on Westerns. The, 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 uh, the reference, I, I think I got the... Jo- I feel like I got the job because that movie, The Hired Hand, the soundtrack of that movie, The Hired Hand, had a pretty big... Have you ever seen no. that? Dude, you're going to fucking love that. Really? It, what is it? Peter Fonda's movie that he made after Easy Rider, when wow. he had a bu- he had a, he kind of had a budget and he could do whatever he wanted. He made this acid, west- acid come down Western with Warren Oates. Oh my God. It's so good. It's so beautiful. The, wow. the opening shot will destroy you. The opening scene will destroy you. It's, um, a, lot, it's a western, like it's just these things that I've never heard about. It goes. There's so always deep. one. Yeah, that's also yeah. what's cool is there's always. It always seems like there's one other western that's again, like a unique western, like a yeah. weird take on a western. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and this one is like the one. And Bruce Langhorn did the soundtrack, and he was he was on some cool early Dylan records. This guy Bruce Langhorn, but mm. he just smoked it on the soundtrack. He mm. just killed it and. It's beautiful, uh, just acid come down, acoustic, western, really, you know, you just got to see it and hear it. It's really its own thing. But when I got approached to do the, to work on this, because I did, to to be clear with the Red Dead Redemption 2 video game soundtrack, um, there's a guy named Woody Jackson who's the main composer, but then they, the the game is so big and they they needed a bunch of Appalachian sounding music, so they they came to me oh, and, and uh, the finger picking sort of stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. but and the first thing I was like, well, I really like this movie, The Hired Hand. They're like, exactly. I was like, okay, good. You know, so once again, like I think if I wasn't like even like I feel like the Super Wolf record that that, that we did is like kind of Hired Hand soundtrack influence. It's definitely yeah. in my I I consider myself influenced by that soundtrack, even though I can't even remember. I can't even tell you what it sounds like at this point because I haven't listened to it in like 15 years. But once I, I listened to it constantly and then started playing it in, in a certain way. Was it, did it coincide with that period? Is there, there's sort of a fabled period in your history where you sort of workshopped finger picking. You like hold up in your apartment yeah, and yeah. just finger pick. Um, it, uh, I know that was, I think I was already getting into finger picking. When the fuck did I see the hired hand? Because I, I feel like it's been, no, you know, it could be around that time. Mm-hmm. Actually, it could be around that time. It was, yeah, it was right around the time that I first like started playing with Will, yeah. which kind of which coincides with the finger picking. So, moving on yes. from the West. Okay, we're, we're leaving well, the West behind. I was wondering, sort of, what your what your daily reading habits are like. What kind of role do books play in in your day to day life? They, I guess they do. They they play a role. <laughs> I mean, I guess there's always a book that I'm reading. The daily reading habit will be, it's generally, you know, it's always before I go to bed, and then, kind of in the afternoons. I mean, when I'm if I'm when I'm home, since I don't have a real job, like I, it's like play guitar, 
you know, procrastinate, play guitar some more, try to get some writing done, do some emails, play guitar, and then book reading for some reason tends to fall in, in, in around the, around sundown, it seems uh -huh. like, uh, that I'll like read if I'm super into a book, I'll read it for like an hour. So then, so maybe I feel like maybe I got, I get like an hour and ideally of reading in a day, I think, yeah. you know, maybe more, so, but Something like that, but it's pretty regular. Are you the kind of person who has a few books on the go at one time? Generally, you shuffle yeah. I'm, around I'm usually between bouncing them. between... Two, I'm often bouncing between two, yeah. And and there's no pattern to it. I wish I'd be like, yeah, I'll read one fiction and one nonfiction, but it's just, you know, it's not really like that. Yeah. Although sometimes I like to contrast them, but it kind of depends. I, I, I think I lean on fiction a lot, but... Yeah. I, it's funny. I don't. I, I, do you ever have you ever found yourself reading a book and realizing that you've already read it? <laughs> this has happened to me a couple of no, times. No, I consciously reread some of the same books right. too many times over and over of again. Course, but yeah. I, I don't think that's happened to me. I've, I've done that with movies, right? But it's, that that happens to you. It's happened to me. That's funny. Um, so, which is to say, my retention is pretty terrible. I think I, I don't. I don't know why that is. I I used to. Maybe it's something that you may have done an interview with somebody who made me feel better about not remembering stuff, about about not remembering books. That sounds familiar. I mean, I know my feeling about because I I kind of I'm a very fast reader, right? Me and then too. I read a little bit more slowly if I find something valuable enough to read twice, right? But I don't worry about retention because I think it gets in on some level or another if you're enjoying it. Maybe it gets that's what very, I think too. Yeah, you know, no, I, I, I used to be embarrassed about it, but then I read some some like kick-ass writer was like, "Oh my god, I can't remember anything I read," but yeah. I love reading. You but know? It's all in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and then then my other thing is, do you, do you use bookmarks? I do. I have a really my my collection of bookmarks is a, very sentimental. I see. I've had some for thirty years. The the only reason that I don't use bookmarks is a, is I kind of like sort of finding you know like like sort of finding where I was and I and it usually forces me to reread yeah, yeah. the page before yeah and then and I'm always sort of horrified about how <laughs> I was like I did read that page before and I totally or did I did I, 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 did I not I, no but then I'll you yeah. know be like okay you know like finding yeah finding where you were this story because you definitely know what you did not read and so like yeah you know like well, like this the, happens to me I read I read in bed a lot yeah so before I fall asleep and yeah. I'll often I'll, I'll be falling asleep. I do two things. I'll fall asleep and lose my place because I'm not aware enough to put the bookmark back in. Right. Or I have, you know what a hypnic jerk is? This? When you're falling asleep yeah, and you like yeah, get, yeah. jolt. Yeah, yeah, I hit my, I bang myself in the head yeah, or the, the face with a book. Yeah, like, I do that all the time. A couple times a week. Yeah, all the time. Yeah. I do, but my, my girlfriend now can see it happening before it happens and she will, will, will grab the book and turn off the light. Intercede. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you tr you know you're on the road a lot as a touring musician through your life? Do you try? What's your strategy for traveling with books? With books, um, I bring. You know, it's better to have one to have ones that don't take up a lot of space. Um, but then it's funny. I have brought chubby books that I just couldn't couldn't stop reading. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I usually br will bring two small books in size, just just because, and. I I wonder I I mean things change so much with traveling so I don't I I don't know if I how steady I am like I don't know if I burn through books when I'm re on the road or if I never read books on the road I'm just trying to think about that right now just because I haven't toured in a minute um, I find that I bring too many books on vacations and trips mm -hmm. and then I just end up reading the most, the easiest one to read. Yeah. If I bring a Lee Child thriller right. and a William Gaddis book, right. I'm reading the Lee Child on yeah. the trip. Yeah. Because I'm already a little distracted or something, maybe. Um, but do you, are there any books that you associate with certain tours? I was going to, that's what I was just thinking, because there has to be, there fucking has to be. My touring thing is way less than it used to be, and that could always change, I guess, but like, then what is. Uh, um. Yes, and I don't remember. Good answer. We'll um, come back around if it comes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and because the yes, but and I but I, and I feel like that it used to play have more of a role. Um, and that could have been because I toured more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
what are your um what are your sort of earliest memories of books what sort of a household did your parents keep in terms of books being around and reading my dad was a uh jesuit so and then he left the jesuits at 27 and he became a chaucer professor so there were a lot of fucking books and around. they were valued probably revered absolutely right? yeah yeah um yeah, and I thought they were really cool. I always liked books, you know, and and uh, they were everywhere in in the house. And then I also remember loving going to my dad's office. Mm. So dreamy to me now, even like like just when I think about it, because it was just like floor to ceiling books, you know, and with cool, you know, because he's a medievalist, so they all look they're cool looking and yeah. like and tarot cards and books and pipes and all that shit. Um, uh, and then I would like go into the books, the piles of books and just pull out books and all that stuff. I was all about it, you know, like yeah. I'm sure looking for pictures and stuff. And there's this one book that I l um, <laughs> would love to find because I don't know. Do you, do you have this like say weird books that you obsessed on when you were a child that were your parents and you, don't know what they were now, but yes, you'd love to find them. Absolutely. Um, okay, there's this one. It was a coffee table size book, paperback. That was a take on Alice in Wonderland, but as pornography. Mm. And and it had, but it was like a real druggy, weird '60s book where it was like characters discussing Alice in Wonderland and being like, "Oh my god, this is actually a pornographic book," and it had all these porn drawings in it, but like, and kind of medical drawings and drawings, medical of, drawings. Uh, drawings of vaginas as the rabbit hole, you know, like, oh. like, and uh, it was such a fucking weird book. And I s would steal, would sneak it out from, uh -huh. I was like four years old, like before, like when I was first starting to be able to put words together and I was, it was like my favorite, yeah. like s s book. And, and I feel like any, so it seemed like anybody who was into Lewis Carroll, you know, who was, a Lewis Carroll type person in the early seventies would have known about this book, you know, because yeah. it was definitely like, I don't know if my dad had it, it had to be accessible to, you know, academics. Yeah. Or whatever. Um, so yeah, they the books were everywhere. And then my, you know, my dad was his, his favorite academic when he was a Jesuit uh, was, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien mm. and C.S. Lewis, um, or did I say Lewis Carroll? Yeah, I did say Lewis Carroll. So yeah, C.S. Yeah. and, and C.S. Lewis, because they wrote these academic papers, mm. and T Tolkien, you know, had came up with this idea. Like he said, he was going to do the Hobbit before he did the Hobbit, and and he and he had this he had this whole idea of kind of creating a new mythology out of all these, like a kind of a, you know, a what do you call it? You're putting all the things together. Like an amalgamation of like, all these different yes, European Catholic mythologies. mythology. Oh yeah. You know? yeah right. <laughs> like, 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 uh, yeah. And sort of positing like, this is possible, you know, like, like, and so he, he came at it that way. It, it was completely conceptual. Mm -hmm. And C.S. Lewis was like his TA. He was like his That's assistant, right. you yeah, know? And yeah. so my dad loved all this stuff, yeah. you know, like, uh, that was his, and because I, I think uh, Tolkien was like a Chaucer guy, you know, like these, these, they're, they're all medievalists and yeah. classicists and they were, and, and yeah. it's mythology. And that was exactly what my dad was into. Mm. So that was his, you know, his rock star was, was Tolkien. And I, I love that connection that Tolkien had to the counterculture in the sixties and seventies. Well, this is what's wild is this is in the fucking fifties. So oh, this wow. is before there was no connection to counterculture. And my, it's just Jesuits are reading this fucking guy. Yeah. He's totally only published in, in the academe talking about this thing. Yeah. So when the book comes out, that book sold something like 5,000 copies in its first 10 years of existence. My dad was like waiting for that book to come out. So it was this crazy, think about that. It was this crazy, you know, it was like a Mertzbau tape or something like yeah, that. You know, yeah. like, a, like it was like- Like a, some deep arcane yes, traded piece of- 100%, yeah. the, the deepest- nerdiest coolest you know like like neatest thing you know that's so, funny to think about like you've read the fellowship of the ring and you can't wait for the two towers to be released oh yeah you know and like yeah. nobody is reading this shit right. no one right. you know and so when it it it's i think it's one i don't know what 
what made it pop off in the in the counterculture. And even the counterculture to my dad was was pop culture, you know, like even that was to my dad was like, oh, okay, well then mm-hmm. now it's everybody's. Mm-hmm. Um, but the again, just doubling back to what books meant. So like the Lord of the Rings was the first book that my dad read. To, you know, I was born in '69, so you read it to you, yeah. Wow, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and Watership Down, and wow. um, yeah, these kind of heavy, scary books. That's heavy stuff. Um, but it was, he loved, uh, and my dad, because he was a medievalist and Chaucer was his thing. Oh, and also Beowulf. Mm-hmm. So he was all about reading medieval English aloud and he loved to read aloud. You know, he was like a coach to read medieval English, which is a thing. There's a competitions. coach to, read, to, to pronounce it correctly mm-hmm. and everything. There's yeah. competitions because it was all meant to be set. It was all meant to be told, yep. you know. Um, yep. uh, wow. So your earliest experience of literature involved very... I mean, I love all the things you're talking about, but it's yeah. a very gloomy, uh, oh, totally you know, baroque yes, kind of world. Yeah, yeah. spooky, yeah. totally spooky. And, oh, fucking M. R. James. Oh, who's tell me more ghost, about M. R. James. A, oh, a ghostwriter, right? Yeah, ghostwriter. Absolutely, yeah. but like, you know, I don't know what the just like like gets deep, deep, freaky terror. He's very he's, gothic. It's about the face at the window. Yes, it's that feeling. You right. know what I mean? Like, like just nailing it. You know, right. and like. He would read us that stuff, <laughs> uh, like like he's he's like, M. R. James is on and, and Poe. He had this beautiful edition of Tales of Mystery and Imagination that Arthur Rackham uh, did the illustrations for. Mm. And Arthur Rackham is this awesome illustrator, yeah. and and uh, and like I was encouraged to read that, you know. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it was absolutely on on the horror side of things, and then to make it even fucking more awesome, somehow. Timothy Hildebrandt moved of the Hildebrandt brothers. The I don't guys, know who this is. They, they they did the first Star Wars poster. They they did early Dungeons and Dragons stuff. But I guess the Star Wars poster is the most iconic. Mm. I'm pretty sure with the, the one where it doesn't really even look like Luke. Yes. He's holding the sword up. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Um, they were these fantasy. Uh, they were brothers. They're fantasy illustrators. But one of the brothers moved to my weird little street in South Orange, New Jersey, and like, you know, would so. Like I would see these paintings of fucking dragons and shit like that. Like I was, like, it's kind of unbelievable. So he and your dad were able to become. They were obviously, pals. there's a yeah, lot of shared yeah, yeah, interests. Yeah, there were there. pals, and my dad yeah. was like, "This guy's great. He does fantasy art. You know, like this is. It was such a tiny scene. Yeah. You know, and like, so yeah, for sure, it was all about. I mean, I loved all that stuff. You know, like, like yeah. but but it was. It was ghosty and fantasy all the way. Did your father being an academic also encourage you to think critically about reading from an early age? Or, you know, did you just, did you talk about what you thought about what you'd read with him? Um, not so much. I feel like thinking critically about, no, not so much. Mm -hmm. What are you reading like my dad's being like, what are you reading? No, I think he would just be more excited. That I was reading stuff that he knew, yeah. you know, um, which he was, he loved it, you know, uh, just luckily I took to reading, you know, yeah. which is funny because I was also a really deeply weird, miserable, possessed, dark kid. And I kind of like went <laughs> against uh, with, but somehow never wanted to hurt my, anybody's feelings or, really hurt anybody. It so was possessed just, by what sort of dark feelings? And yeah, thoughts? man, totally. Like my earliest memories are, are like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like really existential distinct, angst dist- at, distinct at looking at my early memories, looking at wallpaper and being like, what the fuck? That's stupid. Like, why am I looking at this? Why am I looking at this? Fuck wallpaper. Yeah. 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 Just like, what is this? You know, really, uh, like some fucking bad spirit was in me for like, but I wasn't like a hellion or lighting things on fire or beating up other kids or anything like that. Yeah. Or, but there was a anyway, which is to say that I didn't. I often did was not into stuff that that was presented to me. Right. You know, um, for like my dad was incredible at woodworking and making things and models, and I like consciously rejected that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, but the the reading part. Uh, I, I was into, and I remember like really getting it fast. Like, like I guess I'd just been around so many books or whatever it was that by like in school, I remember being able to spell centimeter when I was six years old, you know, and being like, okay, yeah, I totally got it. That's this. a point of pride. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, yeah. like, uh, and 
Yeah, one hundred percent because of my parents. So what? what, what I want to hear about your mother's reading. So she would too. have like. She was in law school, so she wasn't around a lot when I was a kid. But she also was a huge reader. But she liked reading trash. Mm. What's so, trash? Well, she liked she, what she calls trash, um, uh, which she loves. She would say, "I love trash." Um, detective novels and things like that. Like, like, but good ones. Like we had every fucking Ross McDonald book. I like, remember we always just seeing them everywhere. Yeah, and uh, and her whole thing was that she had to read you know because she was i think she also was an english major and then she ended up going to law but you know just like all this reading for work and so she only wanted to read for for pleasure so her whole thing she's like i only want to read garbage i don't want to read anything that's supposed to be smart or good ross for mcdonald or, is not garbage i know but but she would just but call I, get, it garbage I get the because, sentiment yeah yeah, yeah 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 no i mean her i think trash and garbage now has an extremely negative connotation <laughs> yeah. back then it just went trashy you pulp. know or like fun pulpy yeah. you know did you think that she did she sort of hold her pulp novels up against your father's deep, deep scholarly pursuits and sort of compare the two. Uh, I think she was like, that's for him. I have no fucking interest in that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For right. sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they, it was, but then I remember also she would have like, uh, maybe Erica Jong books mm-hmm. and stuff. I think that was in every household that was just, at a certain point in the seventies yeah. for sure. It had to be there. Was she fear of flying? Fear of flying. Yeah. Yeah. That book was around. All right, and, and what was funny is I would sneak, I would read that book as if it was pornography. Yeah. Like, well, you Fucking, would hear, in my old house, right? so I had to be seven years old when I was like reading this stuff. I remember w- hearing that certain books had sexy passages in them, and so I'd search for them. But yeah. I mean, like Portnoy's Complaint by Philip yeah. Roth. <laughs> I'm just trying to find the sex when I'm yeah, eight. Yeah, yeah and, same, you know. same. No, that that would 100 percent Portnoy's Complaint. Like, yeah. okay, I'm gonna I want to pick up that book because apparently he talks about jerking off. Or something yeah, like that. at some point. Yeah, yeah. I remember trying to re- also, but then I, I mean, God, I remember being like five years old and finding a penthouse magazine in my dad's. And I was fascinated with reading what the women, mm. what the quote unquote, the women were saying, wow. were quote unquote saying. Um, yeah. Uh, like, you know, you mean the sort of like the humanizing, like bits between the pictures. Company. Yeah. Yeah. Like my interests are. Yeah. But all, and, and the penthouse ones, they would be like the little more, you know, and, but I just remember this one, I, I swear to God, I remember I was like five years old. I did not know what fuck meant. But I could read it, and I'd heard my parents say, but I didn't know what it meant. Right. And there was this woman going, you know, and all guys want to do is fuck and fuck and fuck, and maybe I just don't want to fuck. And I remember reading this thing in Penthouse Magazine and just being like, wow, I don't know what any of this means, but, like, I'm so into this. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. But, yeah, it was definitely, like, there was a lot of going through my parents' shit to read. Well, again, it, it, it it's that's a... We were lucky to be kids around the same age, around mm-hmm. the same time, because the the literature, both like pop and like heavier of the seventies, there was a lot of really sexy stuff going on. Fuck, a yes. lot of occult stuff and a lot of sex stuff. So it was yep. good stuff to find. And then, and also like like National Lampoon, somehow yeah. I would get my hands on and hide that. And I remember even you know the the one that I hid the most was weirdly Cream magazine. Cream, yeah. I even remember like. Now we're going to when I'm, it's like 1980, so I'm like 10, and seeing Prince in Cream Magazine mm-hmm. wearing the fucking, the, the, the underwear, you know, whatever you call it, bikini underwear, yeah. and just, it was so shocking and scary that I remember I was like, I have to hide this from, like, if my <laughs> parents find this, I'm fucking dead. Like, so weird. What do you what do you remember about your reading in high school? Well, of course, I had the inevitable. It was a lot in high school. It was insane. Like I think the reading got like out of hand. Whenever like the Stephen King bug hit, which mm-hmm. is probably when I was about twelve or thirteen, mm-hmm. and and also that coincided with like my parents. My parents divorced. Like I guess right before my freshman year of high school. Mm. And all, and I was bummed out, and all I would do is read. Like, it was insane. And definitely Stephen King. I'm sure there's so many Which books have, do you remember uh, by, by, King, by King back then, reading the most? I read, I feel like I read every, even the Richard Bachman stuff, um, all of it, up until It. Mm-hmm. And I it's guess like The 86. Stand. What, what is that? 86? 86-ish is It. Yeah. The so, Stand so, is or much earlier. 
The Stan was earlier? Yeah, the Stan was the late 70s, I believe. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. Wait, but it got... came out in a new edition I got in the, the 80s, edition. like a that's expanded, right. like unedited, less less edited. I think that's yeah, what I had. Like, yeah. uh, Do you have a favorite Stephen King book that you... I love the one with the the four seasons or whatever it was called. The, those, yeah, the, the different, different seasons. Different seasons, yeah. The Body is the Stand By Me story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember really loving that. Yeah. Um, I remember loving the cover illustration of the angry moon and the angry cloud blowing, uh, blowing snow. Right. Yeah. 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 That, that was it. Like kind of a circle. It was a circle with yeah. each season represented by an angry anthropomorphized weather god. I rem- <laughs> I remember Pet Cemetery being so fucking scary. I couldn't believe it. That is my the book. favorite. Just be Stephen like, King. Oh my! It was so scary. Not just scary, but incredibly. It's the most nihilistic book he ever yeah. wrote. Oh my god! There's right, no the, hope. Yeah, zero. In that book yeah, yeah. At all. Yeah, it was killer. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, that guy can't get enough credit for turning people on to 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 like just insane amounts of reading. I think. I yeah. mean, I know so many people are Stephen King kids. I just sort yeah. of was, I usually assume if somebody's re- reedy who's who's my age, that they had a Stephen King period. Stephen King, and oddly enough, Judy Bloom. I sure. think are the oh twin God. pillars of oh getting kids okay. to read. Okay. Right now you just got me off this whole other thing. The li- the school library, I fucking loved. It's so funny. I was sick. I was, well, anyway. Um, I loved the, the, the library, and I loved the Maplewood library. The, so I grew up in South Orange and Maplewood. I loved going to the library. I fucking loved it, mm-hmm. you know? And even the school library, I would just go in, and bookstores, too. I loved it. So B. Funny. Dalton. Hell yes. Yeah. Looking at Hollywood Babylon for the first time yeah. with B. Dalton and yeah. the Livingston Mall. Are you fucking kidding me? So, and I remember my parents were always happy. They were like, that is so great. I was like, I'm just going to go to the bookstore. You guys can do, do whatever you right. want. And I would just camp out in the bookstore. Yeah. You know? I was the same. Yeah. Um, did, did, did you read Judy Bloom as a kid? Fuck yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. And, great. and then even like the sillier stuff, like Super Fudge, I was into. Mm-hmm. Like, 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 uh, but. Yes, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, I loved how she had two sides. There was like Tales of Fourth Grade, nothing, yes. Super Fudge, Blubber, which yeah. were kind of funnier. And then, and then, then like, their gods. And, and uh, then again, maybe I then won't. Again, maybe that I was won't. Yeah. really dark. And night. I remember I was like, what? That was like, that freaked like, me out. The kid had a wet dream. Yeah, yep. I remember all that. So, and I remember being like, what the fuck is a wet dream? Right. What is a wet dream? Like, like when am I going to have one? Yes, yeah. Um, but like the, uh, who else was, I, who did I really love? Arnold Roth? I don't know who that is. He was a funny illustrator. Hmm. And I want to say this guy named Ronald Searle. They both kind of looked alike. And they did these sort of funny, dark, sort of sub Edward Gorey, but not really. Hmm. They were really cool. And I remember I was super obsessed with him. Where were they published? I don't, I don't like, Was it their I own mean, books I, or were is, they in? This is like school library when wow. I'm like in fourth, fifth, and fifth grade. Huh. And he had a grip of books. Um, and he was really, really cool. I should, after this, we'll look him up and see, see, yeah. see if it ages well. Um, there's another pillar, I think, for people like you and me, and that mm-hmm. was Mad Magazine. Oh my God, forget about it. Right, one hundred. Like, like, and my, and weirdly, my dad had a whole bunch, uh-huh. so he got me started. That was also like through reading through my dad's shit. They're they're Mad Magazine. So like, I remember. Th- like knowing about movies, all these adult movies, I knew the movie, the Mad Magazine movie parody version yeah. of them, and so like, yeah. uh, like so much of my understanding of the seventies pop culture was through the Mad Magazine lens, one hundred fucking percent. I think Mad made us oddly sophisticated. My dad, my, so of course, as my dad is a English guy, he loves satire. So Mad is totally accept, is he's just loves that. It's I'm like into Punch it. Magazine for its time. Yeah, and, and yeah. He, so my dad was like encouraged mad magazine would buy me any kind of and also again at b dalton they had the mad magazine book so every time i'd come home with a mad magazine book yeah. um yeah absolutely huge she uh and and again it was you know mad magazine seems to be kind of they're they're, they're doing it again did they ever stop i don't know but they seem to have like they're i think maybe they did because i feel mm. like I, i've been following some guys like Johnny Sampson and stuff on Instagram. Do you I don't know, him? know who that is. He's a comic book writer okay. and he's really good. And he uh, he's been doing stuff for Mad Magazine. And I think like there's Mad Magazine number five just came out. So I think there's a new editorship, and it seems very aware of what it is and very proud of the Mad yeah. Magazine thing. Almost maybe as if the the post 
70s incarnation never existed maybe is what they're going that's for good. i could be wrong but that that's what it seems like to me i think i maybe you committed this kind of took this course too but for me mad sort of ended um when i discovered when the graphic novel boom happened right when sure. like all of a sudden you were reading watchmen I, you're like i don't need mad anymore I've yeah got- you know I got, well, y'all, yeah, that's true. I got into comics, but not even Watchmen because I, I just didn't know about that. I went more fantagraphics y, you know. Mm, like um, who? Maybe like Eight Ball and shit like that. Dan Klaus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for sure. And Charles Burns. But I Dan Klaus he- was huge for me. Yeah. That, that early, early stuff was massive for me. Like He was so, there was nobody like him. It was like a funny comics version of Twin Peaks. Yep, sort totally. of David Lynch of Blue Velvet Absolutely. or something. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Like a, the art, Velvet Glove cast an iron. Yeah, yeah, like a Velvet Glove cast an iron. You know, I always thought one of his best stories was this, is a story called Wild Night in Tiger Town, which is about, it's a, people telling a story about how they meet, meet this, their idol who is a, who is like a Little Richard-esque, but more obscure. It's about record collectors getting a, you know, searching for records and then hearing a story about, about a guy who hung out with, with their favorite little Richard style, crazy records, record guy. And Mm -hmm. then, and then this guy is like playing in a Jefferson airplane cover or Jefferson starship cover band at the end. He's like, all right, Davis, we'll take it easy. He's like, starts playing, they built the city and these two teenagers are like, how does, how can a guy who got to hang out with the coolest guy ever be this guy? You know what I mean? And for me, it's wild night in tiger town. I think it's, it's a story of everything in a way. It's just yeah. like, it sort of just tells the entire story of fetishizing something before your time, yeah. seeking out records, finding out the real story, and then and then seeing that adulthood, that, that, that whatever cool shit you're into is not going to define what your life is going to be. Nor support you financially. In any way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, what, uh, what sort of stuff did you start reading? We started to get into this, but I want to hear more about what you started reading in high school when you started to, you know, you discover... Other punk st- music and things like that. Those research books were were huge, 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 huge. So t- talk a little bit about what those were. Like uh, Apocalypse Culture. Or, uh, 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 well, oh no, sorry. Uh, right, um, excuse me. Uh, industrial, the Industrial Culture Handbook. Exactly. Excuse me. And pranks. And pranks was huge. But can you tell? Um, t- what it is? Talk a little bit about what research was. So research was basically like really intense counterculture that was not. It, that you that you sure shit weren't going to know about um, collected for you and interviews with the people who wrote it and uh, you know sort of like a zine but it was in a book form and had an awesome aesthetic graphically mm-hmm. really hard and beautiful looking like you know like really uniform and mm-hmm. type the type uh, like they were all great like like and they they what were some of the other uh, uh, well, modern primitives. Was modern huge. primitives was like yeah. tattooing and piercing culture before any of that yes. was anywhere Wait, near. When mainstream. it was this fucking crazy ass thing, that, then it, where it was as wild as their book on uh, like uh, the, the guy who did, like the J.G. Ballard type books yes. that they did. Did they do a whole like Ballard? thing? They did a few Ballard things, yeah. and they also did Charles Williford. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that they Maybe. did. They published, I believe, Wild Wives. Huh. I could be wrong about that, but they published right. a Williford novel in a huge, you know, sort of folio size edition. So Ballard, I mean, Ballard back when they first did Ballard was a cult writer. Yeah, Nobody all knew of who this Ballard shit, and was. As, as was tattoo and piercings. It was this kind of thing. Again, you're sitting, it's 1985, you're in New Jersey. It's just like, it's like if you don't want to get into, you know, even, you know, it's, this is fuck sounds fucked up, but like something like faces of death was similarly like, this is like secret information, you know, or like mm-hmm. stuff maybe you're not supposed to know, but just like wild shit. And once you get, once you're like his face is death is kind of gross, but I really want to know about all this other weird shit. Research just had it all there, and it was presented non sensationally, mm-hmm. you know, and and it was fucking exciting. It was yeah. so goddamn exciting. Yeah, um, I think in a way, research was kind of like an, a form of what the internet became for yep. the generation after us. Absolutely, a way to find sort of dark corners of culture yep and and a way like a, a, a way forward and and something something to look forward to when you got out of high school yeah. <laughs> like you're like okay i want to go go where this is and 
Steve, or like that's how I found out about sur- survival, sur- survival research laboratories, mm-hmm. you know. Which was this Bay Area art collective that built machines, these hybrid machine, dead animal taxidermy machines that sort of self-destructed. And yes, that were giant up. machines. And that you would sign a waiver if you were to go to an exhibition, that you'd sign your life away because you could possibly get killed could watching get these get hit things. with shrapnel. Yeah. And actually, uh, they uh, Pascal... Uh, brought them to New York and they did a fucking show at the Marlboro Gallery, that, which is the first recently, time that they've yeah. ever been in an art gallery. I wish I'd seen that. It was great. Um, but uh, yeah, research was absolutely essential. <laughs> like, yeah. And yeah. for those listening, research is stylized R-E slash search. Yes, that's um, right. And those books are still available. It was, I believe it was a couple, um, mm-hmm. Andrea, Andrea Juno and, yeah. and Vicky Vale, the Vicky, guy was named yeah. Vicky Vale. Yeah. I think they split up. Yeah. Um, but the books are still around. Yeah. Um, what about fiction in high school? Did you get it? Did you have a beat a beat phase like a lot of kids? A little did? bit, but not. You know, who was the? It's funny. I really got into crime novels. I got super into the Fletch series. Wow. I was into. I've never read those. The, they're good. Are they? Yes, very good. Okay. Um, way more nuanced. Um, and and. Uh, I don't even, I even, for some reason, got to the Robert, guy wrote Spencer for Hire, which is this endless, yeah, right. very moral Boston cop thing. I just would read just every kind of series of, of cr- detective crime thing that I could get my hands on. Then, then I got into Jim Thompson. Uh-huh. Very hard-boiled. Yes. And so, that, books. so then I started kind of getting into that stuff. Uh, um, What were the, I'm trying to think of, like English class was the only class that I liked in high school. So I actually would read all those books, you know, that yeah. were assigned yeah. and, and enjoy them. Cause I, again, just lucked out and I had two, not one, but two excellent English teachers in, in high school yeah. who made you want to read and could convince, you know, like they were like, I remember the Mr. Dawson, Harry Dawson, he was so fucking cool. He li- lived in Greenwich village took the train out to Jersey to teach at this shitty Catholic school that wow. I went to and was just like, he was the guy. He, Sounds he would, like the setup for a Richard Yates story. It was something. so fucking funny, but he was the dude and he went, and his best friend was the other great teacher, Richard Binkowski. And they met at NYU. I think they went to this there at the same time that all those Scorsese type guy or whatever they, I think they were kind of in that crew, Yeah, but they just ended up getting a gig the wow. get, basically getting tenured at Seton Hall <laughs> and they just never left and they kind of figured out how to do their lives. But these guys were not with the program that my school was with, you know, but they were the two best teachers and they only taught the smartest kids. They saved my ass with 100%. Like, yeah. like they kept me engaged and kept me challenged. We're, were hard on me in yeah. the right way. And I remember Dawson talking, he just, he talked about how the red badge of courage that the dude who wrote the red badge of courage and I, I think maybe some of the information may have changed since then, but he goes, he's like, this guy did not, had not seen any action in, he had not ever been to a battlefield. And when he was, when people found that out, they tried to say that this wasn't, that the story was invalid, mm-hmm. you know? And his whole thing was like, read the story and tell me if you think that, if it changes your perspective about what war is like, yeah. and of course it does. Yeah. And, and, and he made this kind of thing about how important fiction is and, it's fiction, even if he never experienced it. If he could write a story that can get in, that 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 can move you to 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 some new perspective about something that maybe you've never been told before, because we've been told that war was glorious. Yeah. Um, you know, like he would, he would talk about sophisticated shit like that. It's you a know? good lesson to yeah. learn at um, that age. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so again, so I was actually enjoying what I was being assigned in high school, which kind of kept me busy. Uh. But like, I feel like there's a, there was, um, I'm probably spacing on some, actually your questions are good. They're actually keeping me going, but I'm probably spacing on some writers that, that were, okay. that were important. Yeah. I think, me. I think most people, at least people like us have a book or two that sort of showed them what the world could be like, like what kind of adult life they wanted to try to get into. Mm-hmm that they read around, you know, the high school years. Mm-hmm, and yeah. they're usually corny things that you're afraid to admit. I mean, yeah. I'll put it right out there. Henry Miller and Jack Kerouac. For sure. When I'm yeah. 15 years old, I'm like, oh, wow. Check that out. You know what's funny is I read on the, I never read on the road, or if I did, I don't remember. And maybe I was like trying to be cool by not reading it. I don't fucking know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I read it, you know, maybe 15 years ago. And 
I guess maybe everybody knows this, but I didn't know it. And it, I think I, this occurred to me, I figured out for myself that this character is, is a noir character and meaning that he's been, that, that he's running away from war trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I never picked up on that. And nobody, I don't wow. know if I was just like, you know, uh, I, I've never heard anybody... That's interesting. I've you, never heard that take on it either. Yo, read it that way, and it's really cool. I mean, I mean yeah, if you and, think and it about just it. explains why they're fucking... Why he's just doing the things that he's doing. You well, know most, what I mean? Most of the noir heroes from like that that era are have are, are tortured emotionally and existentially. But because they went to fucking war. By World and War then, II. And then, yeah. and then that's the deal, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, like, On the Road struck me as a, as a really... It's just, I couldn't not think it, you know, when I was yeah. reading it as a, somebody who was in my mid thirties, yeah. you know? Yeah. So that, that, that was kind of cool. And the language is really beautiful. That's fucking awesome. In, in, yeah, in it really books. held up. That's the thing. I yeah. was like, wow, this is, I thought it was going to be, I, I really don't know why I picked it up, but, but I, I think I picked it up to see like, let's see if this sucks or not. And I just blew through it yeah. and, and it was great. We're going to, oh yes. No, go ahead, please. Well, I was going to say, it was pointed out that, or a, a buddy pointed out that we're, we're talking about how war creates a certain vibe with the people who come back and uh, as far as art and literature. And this is just to, to transition into another book that I liked, which is this book, Cherry by this guy, Nico Walker. And this is very recent, right? Yes. And yeah. so the same guy, my, my, my buddy Matthew Johnson, is sitting there thinking about how all these wild bank ro all these wild stories happen with people who come home from war uh, bank robbers and mm -hmm. you know like after the civil war that's when all the kind of crazy bank robber types and uh, yeah, yeah. Were, were happening and i guess same same after first world war and same after second world war and so he was like i wonder who the great bank robbers of the of the of the new wars are the gulf wars well, the for gulf example. wars yeah. so he uh, looks up bank robber war hero you know and boom he see, reads about this guy who had robbed 11 banks you know, all in suburban Cleveland in a really short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And he's like, huh. And then he finds a story on the guy uh, in BuzzFeed, I guess. Huh. And he's like, huh. So he writes the guy, he sends the guy a Barry Hanna book with five bucks in it. Barry Hanna. Yeah, Good because cause, uh, Hanna was one of Matthew's teachers, I guess. Uh, okay. So he sends this guy. Anyway, that's, the, that's how the book got started. And, wow. and and he started visiting this guy in prison wow. and encouraging him to write. And then the guy started writing and Matthew's like, oh God, he's terrible. And, then, <laughs> and he's like, no, you should probably keep on writing. You write. and, yeah. and he walked this guy through through it. The book's great. I had no idea. Well, the book, I, I haven't read it. Yeah. To be fair, I read the first chapter and it didn't grab, but I, right. I said I would come back to it. Yeah, yeah. But um, it, it certainly was one of the biggest books of, of this year. Yeah, dude. The, the, and, and there's an afterward that tells the whole story. That, that, that gives Matt paraphrasing. credit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great, fantastic. Yeah. He's um, still in prison, but anyway, that's a good. What's you know what the the probably the best thing about that book is that it's a book for people who don't normally read, which is th those kind of books are really important, mm -hmm. you know. Like, and uh, my girlfriend works with all these young guys, and she that that book got around her work, and every kid read it. And oh, that's out. cool. And that's so like young skater kids. Yes, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully, like a lot, like like they were like. I talked to this, this one kid who was like, dude, I read it. I couldn't stop reading it, you know, and, and then he gave it to a friend. He couldn't stop reading it. It's, it's got, there's something about that voice that is really talking. Well, it's authentic to, from what I could tell yeah. to, to, to their experiences more yeah. so than a lot of things would be. Yeah. Maybe it's a gateway thing too. That's what I think is, yeah. I mean, I, that's why you, like you can never shit on any of those books that for, for people who don't read uh, initially because they're meant to be read by young people and, yeah. and it's going to stick. Like, you know, I mean, you know, Bukowski and all this, you know, like, yeah. like, I mean, he's great, but also there's plenty of people who will only read one Bukowski book and never yeah. read a book again. And, and yeah. you know. Bukowski and another B writer, uh, very different, but brought again. Yeah, totally. A lot of people just read a couple of books. Yeah, <laughs> and, they're, and, and they're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? That's still... At book. least you're reading. Yeah, at least you're reading, you know. How do you feel about poetry? Uh, I think it's, I like it and I don't read it. Uh, I barely read it enough and I feel like a dick about that. You have poetry guilt, kind of. Yes, I do. Who's, who's a poet that you know that you like? <sighs> 
I asked because you're a lyricist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would call this guy Muhammad Rabbit a poet, I guess. I don't know him. He's a dude who was illiterate, and he was like Paul Bowles' lover. And he's still alive, this guy. But his, I, I, I think he's great. It's spelled M-R-A-B-E-T. And he would just make up the shit off the top of his head and then, and because he couldn't write actually. And oh. then Bowles would write it down. Was it in like Tangiers during that period? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah He's yeah. awesome. Muhammad R- Rabbit, uh, yeah. what's the book to get? There's one called M- Mahashish that's really good. I've, I've read fucking all of his books. Great. I've never heard of him. Oh, dude, it's awesome. Um, like, and you know, it's funny. My dad read me a lot of poetry growing up. Uh, Lewis Carroll again. Lewis Carroll. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. yeah. And Beowulf, of course. Yeah. It's funny, before my dad died, he got obsessed with the Bhagavad Gita, and he was, like, so mad that he hadn't read it before. Mm. Like, he was just like, God damn it. He's, he said his huge regret was not being aware of just of that, of the East. <laughs> you know, he's wow. a total Western guy. Yeah. Um, and he said there's one thing that he could, that, that, that he could change. It was, it, it, he would have just paid a lot more attention to wow. that. Yeah. Um, and that book's pretty cool. You know, I read it when I was really young. I was raised with sort of Eastern religions, so right. I read it yeah. um, when I was too young to really it's pretty cool. appreciate it. It's, but yeah, it's, I it's worth, I should find, I have my dad's annotated copy. It's bananas. Oh, cool. It is bana- Just imagine an old guy who's looking at death, taking notes on it. It's fucking crazy. That is really beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Remember that crazy period in New Jersey hardcore when everybody thought they were Krishna for a second? And they would carry around the Bhagavad Gita as it is, that interpretation, interpretive book of the Gita. I was, that was a little after my time, but I mean, yeah, but that was all because of like the Cro-Mags, right? It was the Cro-Mags, but then in Jersey, in my time, it was also really due to Ray Capo from Youth of Today's Youth of Shelter. Today. Right, yeah, yeah, Shelter, Shelter was that was the thing, band. yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyway. yeah I, was, I, was, I was like, because I'm like a year or two ahead of you, like, like yeah. that I like... Be glad that you yes, didn't have to I be. Did. I was, we were making fun of that shit so bad. Seeing Krishna's trying to mosh <laughs> city gardens in Trenton was no, just not that's really unforgivable. Um, what's a book? What's the first book that comes to mind when I ask you about something that made you laugh? Laugh out loud. What's one of the funniest books you've ever read? I've been on the Sam Lipsight kick, so like mm-hmm. his shit. I've, I've, I, this is not my line about him. I can't read it in on an airplane because I laughed. Mm-hmm. Like I'm literally like, Wah! like. And there's something about his stuff that, like, not only do I laugh out loud, but I want to, like, read it out loud to somebody. Yeah. Because it's just so fucking, so goddamn good. Sam Lipside is great. He is great. He, I think, I can't, if, I think he's one of the funniest fucking people I've ever read. What would you have someone read first if they've never read Sam Lipside? You know, get uh, get the fun parts, which is the the short story book. And if you feel, if you're a guy who likes it, or, or a woman who likes it longer read do um the ask his novel. It's a novel it's so good has he i feel bad not knowing this but i feel like he's become less active he's a not he's publishing a professor so much. oh is he at, okay. at columbia but he's got a new book that's coming out and it's like great it's incredible it's right. called hark and i was able to scam a uh a, a, a advanced copy which I actually brought out here for db to read maybe he could give it to you when he's done i'd love um, to check that out uh dude yeah, he's great. Um, other funny ass writers. I mean, uh, our boy uh, Williford is so goddamn funny. Charles Williford is hilarious, especially the Hulk Mosley book. Yes, so yeah. funny. This is Hulk- a primer for people who don't know. Is Williford was is one of the greatest on. Uh, you know, not quite as not recognized famous. as he should be yeah. uh, writers of mostly crime fiction. Yeah. The end of his life, his last four books were a series of books that take place in Miami with a detective named Hulk Mosley, and they're fucking essential yeah. yeah the 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 williford hoke mosley novels are you know, great who i thought you were going to say is our because you said our boy um patrick dewitt oh my very, god very funny, he's a fucking funny, funny novelist. so funny and did you get his his new one french exit not yet dude french exit also howlingly yeah. howlingly funny there's some fucking lines and french exit you know it's funny pat, pat loves and I'm going to get on this kick too. He's just, he really loves 20th century English women writers. And he's, you mm. know, he's right. He's like, why? He's like, this just, he's like, I feel like I should just only read women writers, you know? Um, mm. Cause duh. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he's, but he's got like, a few like that he Ivy loves. Like Ivy Compton Burnett kind I of people. I think so. Yeah. Like stuff the, that the, I know nothing about. These very witty arch 
Yeah. Yes. Ivy Compton Burnett was a was a was a writer who was really big with the poets like Frank O'Hara and John Ashbery. These okay. sort of the gay crew at Harvard in the in the forties. And they loved her. They loved her. Okay. And she's so, very funny, very cutting. It's like sort of like a Gosford Park sort of stuff. I need I need um, I need that stuff. But he well anyway, with that in mind, he there's a character in the the, the book. The main character of this book is a incredibly harsh um rich woman who should you should, you should just hate and mm. she's so good mm -hmm. she's just such she's so funny and she's uh, yeah. so self-possessed and yeah. it's one of the cool coolest anti-heroes I, I ever i heard I him read a bit on um kcrw from it in her voice and it was very acerbic and witty and harsh and dark fucking funny um what about a book that um that scared you this book called Rising Tide because it's so. That's a that's a nonfiction book. Um, Flaking on the writer's name. It's also it's another Matthew Johnson nonfiction recommend. Um, Got to talk to this guy, dude. Smokes it. Um, he kills it. He grew up like in a library. Mm. Um, so Rising Tide. What's it about? It is about the flood of twenty seven uh, and which the Mississippi River flood. Mm -hmm. That so all the songs about when the levee breaks and all mm -hmm. that shit it's about wow. this flood. Mm -hmm. But the parallels to our time are eerie. In terms of the government not being there to yes. support the victims. Yes, and in terms of, of unimaginably horrific politicians, it's really wild. Like, I, I can't recommend it. Not, right enough. Matthew sold it to me as, as it's the history of rock and roll without ever saying, without ever talking about music. And, wow. and that, that, that's a pretty, that's a sexy description of it. Um, but it's just, I mean, you know, it was all about when the levees were about to bust. It was all about sandbags and, and having black, black laborers using sandbags. And then when there weren't enough sandbags, they were like, okay, just lie down, and they use human beings as sandbags. Huh. Shit like that. Um, and shit like a city like New Orleans knowing that it was going to be destroyed but having to lie about it. Uh, just get it. It's called Rising Tide, it, and and surprisingly, if you look up Rising Tide, th th that book will pop up uh, yeah. if you look up Rising Tide book. Um it's really, really good, and it's fucking terrifying. I had to keep on putting it down because <laughs> I was like, I can't do this. This is too, too yeah. much of a parallel. I, mean, I was, I was thinking you'd talk about a horror novel, but this is yeah. a lot. Dude, yeah, unfortunately, I hate worse. to say it, but oh, and then yo, know, as far as like horror stuff, um, Thomas Ligotti is really fucking scary. Amazing. Yes, he is. He's the dude, and the the easy uh, or a, a, a way of frameworking his stuff is um uh he true detective see look D dv's bailing um uh he was yes. a, he was like a secret should have been a much more clear uh, clearly admitted influence on this first season of true detective he, in true detective all the, all the 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 most compelling rants that the mcconaughey that mcconaughey's character goes on are legati yeah. par paraphrases yeah. um Gotti writes these things that are almost plotless a lot of the time, just mm -hmm. these sort of existential non-place horror rants. Yeah. That, 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 that sounds like a bad, that's a bad sales pitch, but they're very compelling. Very, really, really compelling, really dreamy, really fever dreamy, really like finds the, the deep horror in shitty urban, you know, like, like an, an, an empty, it's an empty apartment in a shitty, mm -hmm. Building, and you he's know, got a and, great book. Uh, I've, my work here is not yet done. I believe it's called uh -huh. something like that. That's all workplace horror, oh, like sick. cubicle horror on yeah, a yeah. very existential level. Um, he's really good. <laughs> he's, he's so gnarly. He's great. Well, the last thing I want to know for now, mm -hmm. um, what's what's a book? What's 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 the book you've given as a gift the most? Uh, the the yeah, I'd say the book to give as a gift is. Up in the old hotel. Joseph Mitchell. Yes. Talk about that a little bit. You know, if I had a gun to my head, that's an easy one to say. That's my favorite book in a way, just because it's... Uh, so it's Joseph Mitchell was a New York writer, and he wrote essentially profiles of compelling New York characters, most of which would be considered marginal people uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. 
Uh, and like oyster salesman down at the Fulton Street Market. An oyster salesman, or a, literally like a, a, the, the guy who's ranting about how you're going to burn in hell, and, and 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 or like a, you know, a, a young, a, a child prodigy kid, you know, who's got some interesting parents, or, uh, um, it's. I can't think of like a just a more enjoyable writer to read, a more a guy who loves his subject, which is the people that he's writing about and New York City. And there's also this like a, a guy that like, or, or just a, a voice that's just like, so many of his stories start with like when it all gets too much, I take a walk, to, you know. Yeah, and and it's always like which starts, is a very New York sentiment. Yeah, but it right. also you're immediately on his side. You're like, okay, this guy's overwhelmed and depressed, you yeah. know. And and what does he do to 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 get out of his head? He goes and takes walks and and pays attention to other people and starts mm. talking to other people. And it's, I mean, it's a fucking home run. That 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 book, I. You, you can't not like that book. Yeah, it's top five for me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it's it's so great. And he has another book called My Ears Are Bent. Like, my dad turned me on to him, you know. Um, yeah. But it's just over and over again. And also, like, so rereadable, so perpetually re, like, 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 it's just, I, I could always pick it up and, and I'm yeah. always happy to be reading it. it. It really, and when I am reading it, I can't stop thinking about it. And I'm always telling people about it. I, I, I probably, like, I've been back into it and, I kept on buying that book and giving it to people. Yeah. Like, uh, and it's also a book that you give to a very grown ass person or a very young person and they're going to, and, and anybody, yeah. you know, the great thing about, for me about his prose is that he's got a very familiar sort of folksy, but not a put on folksy sort of way of writing where it just feels like you've met somebody in a, in a restaurant or a bar and they're telling you stories. Yeah. It comes across very, Eloquent but conversational. Yeah, he's he's uh, he's he, and he's the the dignity that he gives mm. you, the reader, and who he's writing about. It's it's like it's it's just it's incredible. Yeah, he treats these really marginalized New York underworld characters with a great deal of dignity. Which Absolutely, is really cool. yeah. Some yeah. some and and some real kooks, and then he, there's a really intense. Did you see that thing that the New Yorker published? It was like the kind of the, they found this last thing that he wrote. I heard about that, but I didn't read that. Oh. Good. That made me cry. Um, what was it? Uh, it's just, it's about walking in New York, but it's uh, about walking outside of Manhattan. And it's sort of like, it's a take on sometimes when it, when I all gets too much, I go for a walk, but it's about this endless, it's sort of him walking endlessly and it, and it not being enough. It's really, wow. because he, I guess, famously just stopped writing yep. in like 62, but never told anybody that he was stopped writing and kept on showing up because he had an office. He wrote for the New Yorker right. and he was a revered writer. So he had an office there and then he just started showing up and he just wasn't writing. Yeah. And they just and that was the end. And that was that great era of the New Yorker where you could be Joseph Mitchell and just hang out in your office for a couple of decades not doing anything. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's what he did. And, but anyway, so you find that thing. It's it's Yeah, I will. Like for, for I found that I I cried and cried when I read that. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jesse. This is a. Um, I. I'm, I hope that this. Uh, that you keep on doing this. And that's it for the first episode of the Apology Podcast. I hope you liked it. Um, thanks again to Matt for sharing his time with me. Since we recorded this talk, I've already tracked down copies of Comanches and The Drop Edge of Nowhere per his recommendations, and neither one of them disappoints. If you want to get more um, of Matt Sweeney in your life, I think there's no better place to start than Superwolf which is the album he and Will Oldham made in 2005 or so. It's like their two-man super group, just some of the best music those two guys ever made, and they made it together. You could also look up Guitar Moves, which is the video series that Matt hosts, where he interviews fellow guitarists and they teach him little tricks. Just plug Guitar Moves into YouTube and you'll find that. Uh, this episode was recorded by me with help from Brett Morris. All the music is Bach, arranged and recorded by Cyrus Garamani. And I had generous production help and general podcasting advice from Laris Kreslins and Justin Geller. You can find more Apology stuff, including the magazine and some merch at apologymagazine.com. And you can always write me with suggestions and complaints, recommendations for books, ideas for guests at hello at apologymagazine.com. Until next time, thanks a lot.